So my name is Linda Trevino, and I am Distinguished Professor of Organizational Behavior and Ethics at the Samuel College of Business at Penn State University. And tell us about your research and what, and how did you get into business ethics? How did I get into business ethics? That's a really good question. Um, I knew I wanted to get a PhD, so I'm on the social science side of business ethics. And I started a PhD in management. I had decided that management was the right arena for me because I'm a very interdisciplinary thinker and management is incorporates psychology and sociology and a lot of different ways of viewing the world. So that seemed right to me. But I did, really didn't have a very specific idea of what within management I, I would study. I was oriented more toward organizational behavior and the, what we call the micro side of things. So people, how people think and behave and that sort of thing. And um, so there are two stories I tell about how I got started. One is sort of the surface level story and that is that I was taking a master's level course because I didn't have an MBA and I needed to basically do that for my PhD. So I took a master's level course in organizational behavior and I had to write a paper and I didn't know what I was going to write it about. But I had started reading the business press. I was not a business person. I had not gone to business school. When I went to college, Nobody I knew went to business school. It was kind of not the thing to do. And so here I was going to business school. I was thinking, I'm going to business school. Okay, let's see. I guess I better find out more about this. So I was reading the business press, and, and it was the early 80s, and we had a lot of scandals. And so I thought, this is sort of interesting. I wonder if we know anything about why people are doing these things, why people behave the way they do. And I started looking into it, doing my library research, and finding out that really we didn't know much of anything at all. So I wrote a paper about that for my OB class, got, got uh, permission from the organizational behavior professor. And um, when I got to the PhD program, one of the first classes I took was a, a class in research design. And he said, okay, for your project, you're going to have to design a piece of research. And I was scared to death because I didn't know anything yet, <laughs> but I had written that paper. So I ended up right, you know, designing a little study based upon this paper I had written, and he liked it. And uh, long story short, um, he encouraged me to work on it more, and I ended up that, that paper ended up being the Academy of Management Review paper that is so highly cited. Um, it got published just before I went on the job market, which was very convenient for me. So that's the surface level story. Um, but I did have a revelation at some point along the way. I think it was when I was writing my textbook, um, writing the preface for that. And it occurred to me that there was something else going on that was motivating me because I had been doing this for years. And it's like, why? Why am I still motivated so much to study these kinds of things? And I think the backstory there is that um, my parents were Holocaust survivors. And so I grew up, there are two kinds of Holocaust survivor families, one that is obsessed about it and the other that uh, is let's get on with it kind of, um, kind of family. And mine was more the latter. We're here, aren't we lucky? <laughs> you know, we survived. Let's work hard, get our kids an education, uh, try to be successful, be Americans. And However, in the background, there was certainly, it was part of our history, and there was a, 
I had a fascination with why people do bad things. And I would have to say well, also why people do good things, because there were people who did very good things. So that's a very long answer to the question of how I got into this and what motivates me. But um, th those are the two kind of different stories that I like to tell. Do your parents ever, ever, did they ever talk about the Holocaust at all? Or do they just avoid talking about it? Or? So in, the question is, to my parents, um, did they talk about the Holocaust? They did occasionally. It was not um, an obsession at all. However, it came up. Uh, there were stories of family member. We had, first of all, we had family all over, uh, family in Israel and family in Europe, and people went wherever they could go. My uh, fa father's uncle was a boat person who I think went to Italy first and then somehow found his way to, to Israel. Um, so there, you know, there were all these stories that were part of the family lore. There were people we knew who had numbers on their arms. You can't kind of ignore that. Um, so, so it was there. And the one thing that I remember, um, my grandmother used to, she was so focused on education, and she would say, uh, that was, that's the one thing they can't take away from you. So, um, I was a good student. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the only reason, but. Now tell me about your, so your first work, would you say, was in the, how was it, well, tell us about your research. How did you begin and what, what do you think are your outstanding contributions, including your textbook, which is. So, how did I get started in, uh, with my research? So, it's actually, that's actually a very interesting story too, I think, because when I started as a social scientist wanting to study uh, ethics in organizations, is the way I put it, ethical decision making, uh, those sorts of things, it was not being done hardly. There were very few people who were doing it. And in my PhD program, people were really worried about me. Um, they were supportive. They wanted me to do what I was passionate about. And my advisor was very supportive of me. But there was nobody in the department who really knew anything about the topic. Uh, there were a couple of people on my committee from outside who did know a little bit. There was a, a sociologist who had done a little bit of work, uh, and there was a social psychologist who had done sort of tangentially related work. Um, but I was a little bit on my own, and um, I admire them so much when I look back for having that kind of faith in me <laughs> that they would let me do it. Um, but they were worried because it, you know, people thought it was a fad. They thought, it was really a danger, dangerous for me uh, from a career perspective. I did get some very good advice. Uh, one of my mentors said, just make sure that you have your feet firmly planted in an area of management, which I, I took that advice and organizational behavior and going back so it's even part of my title still. Uh, organizational behavior is, is where my feet are firmly planted and the, you know, the theories I use um, fit within that management framework. And, uh, but it was, it was new and going on the job market was really challenging. Um, people really wanted to have normative conversations about business ethics. They, you know, they wanted me to talk about what was ethical and how did I know what was ethical? And I said, well, that's not really what I do. You know, I, I, I study how, you know, what influences people to make certain kinds of decisions. And it was, it was really challenging in the early days. And people for years, I had a, one of my favorite stories to tell is that I, 
I had an interview with a very prominent business school when the year I was on the job market and the department chair took me to breakfast and he looked me in the eye and he said, you know, you're never going to get tenure doing that ethics stuff. <laughs> and, um, well, I showed him, so, yes, yeah. So um, my research has been focused on, um, it's actually, I, I, I like to refer to it as a research stream, not a program, because it, I'm not the kind of person who, I actually don't have the patience to just study one thing. I kind of go where my interests take me and one of the joys of my career has been working with doctoral students and so I and my I very am very committed to their careers and their development and so I want them to carve out something that's theirs they're not just my student doing my work and so what we try to do usually is find an area of overlapping interest and then I find myself getting sort of taken down this little stream and this little stream but all of it is related to ethics and organizational context and one of the things that I think I have contributed is uh, to try to get people to think about the context so it's not just about individuals making decisions it's individuals making decisions and taking actions in the context of organizations and pressures and leaders and group members and you know all the things that affect human behavior so that's probably um, in from a big picture perspective what I feel that I've contributed and tell us just a bit about your textbook because I think that's been, well obviously it's widely used. And is it still in print? Yeah, so I have a textbook that uh, I'm working on the, I always forget what edition is, I think it's the 8th edition. Um, so that's an interesting story too. Um, I So I'm, I work at a in a department where textbook writing, I'm I don't think anybody else has ever, in the 30 plus years I've been there, uh, written a textbook. Uh, I'm the only one. Now where I came from, Texas A&M, there were a number of textbook writers, but um, I wasn't planning to write a textbook. It, it's not something that is that really that valued or rewarded where I am. But what happened was I way back in the early days at Penn State. Um, first of all, I wanted to teach a, a business ethics class, and I wasn't. I was teaching organizational behavior when I first got there and, and intro to management. And I looked at textbooks, and they just didn't seem to fit me because they were not written from a management perspective. They were mostly written by philosophers, and they were fine, they just weren't, um, it wasn't the course I wanted to teach. So that was in the back of my mind. Um, but what happened was I met uh, Kate Nelson, who at the time was working at Citibank. It was Citibank at the time, this is pre-Citicorp, and it's a long time ago. There was a front page Wall Street Journal little, one of those little uh, blurbs about a game. She was working in uh, HR communications and she had designed with some other people a game uh, for new employees to learn about ethics in the organization and how to make ethical decisions. Um, and that resulted because they had designed, of all things, a video, an orientation video for their new employees, and they showed it to John Reed, who was the CEO at the time, and 
he looked at it and he said, this is very nice, uh, but you don't have anything about integrity here. And we can't have that. You have to, you know, go back to the drawing board, do something. So um, the way Kate tells it, she was tearing her hair out, you know, because integrity is like a little hard to record, video, video record, because it's kind of abstract. So um, she came up with this idea in the middle of the night. She decided that a game would be the way to orient people around this issue. So she designed this game, and she's very clever and great. And so she, uh, I called, I got on the phone, I saw this little blurb, I got on the phone and I called an app, uh, called City Bank and asked for Kate Nelson. They put me through. She picked up the phone, which apparently she never did, and we talked, chatted, we got along immediately, and she said, well, next time you're in New York, why don't you let me know, and we'll go and have lunch, and so I did, and we did, and we just really hit it off. It was strange, you know, I, I, just a compatibility, and I started inviting her to Penn State to run the game with my MBA students, and that was very successful, and then on one of her visits, she came to my house, and we decided we might want to try to write an article together. And we sat down and we started outlining an article. And by the time we were done, we had a book outline. But we were planning to write a, a trade book. And then one day, a fellow named Bill Oldsey, who was a Penn State alum, a you know, had blue and white blood running through his veins. He had grown up in State College and went to Penn State and had a paper, you know, a cardboard cutout of Joe Paterno in the window of his office on Third Avenue in, in New York. And um, he was the, he was like a publisher. He had a very high position. And those people usually don't show up in the hallways of your business school, but because it was Penn State, he showed up that day, and they were look they're always looking for authors. So he showed up in my office, and we're talking, and I said, well, I have this plan to write a trade book. And Bill said, no, 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 you have to write that as a textbook. That would be great. It would be wonderful. And so I talked to Kate. And we decided, well, maybe it makes some sense. So we totally changed our orientation, wrote it as a textbook, although it's, it's not really written as a traditional textbook in some ways. She's a practitioner, um, very kind of no-nonsense writer. And uh, I always say I keep her honest in the sense that she can't say things that aren't supported by research, and she keeps it um, very readable, and, although I think I'm a good writer too, but she, she uh, is attuned to, you know, what managers would respond to and that sort of thing. So we've been at this, uh, the first edition came out in 1995, and we're still at it. Yeah, we're still at it. Yeah, it's been pretty successful, yeah. So that, I actually feel like I've made a contribution um, because so many students around the world, really, it has been used, uh, surprisingly, because it's written, I think, from a U.S. perspective, but students around the world are being exposed to my way of thinking, um, which introduces the normative frameworks in, a, in an admittedly oversimplified way, but also um, the other ways of thinking about how you manage this kind of behavior. How do you have to, as a manager, how do you have to understand this kind of behavior in order to manage it? And also understanding your own biases, your own, you know, your own thinking processes um, in order to manage your own behavior as well. So 
Um, so bringing, being able to bring that to a very wide audience, and I understand ethics and compliance officers also have it on their shelves, some of them, so, so that feels good too. That's great. Yeah. Does field work at Citibank and other places, uh, other sectors? I'm sorry, what was the, the field question? Work for, for this, the field research, did you do that in Citibank and other places? Or? Well, um, the research that's represented in the book comes from all over. It comes from my work, but other researchers' work. But there's actually, there were a lot of examples in there that came from Kate's experience over the years, mostly in the financial services industry. But after she left Citibank, she did consulting and so worked with other industries as well. Yeah. Linda, you've done work with companies. You just talked about this. You've done work with other companies, too. How has your work influenced the way companies, ethics officers, and those who are actual practitioners do their work? I know you've been involved at ECI with the fellows yes. program and so on. Talk about that intersection between business practicality and then the work that you do at the university. Yeah. So. I would say I have colleagues, I don't know if so much in business ethics, but in, in management, I have colleagues who I think don't really care that much about whether their work is used by um, actual people <laughs> in organizations, which has always been a little odd to me. Um, it does matter to me. It's always mattered to me. And it's one of the reasons that I've been involved for more than 20 years in what was Ethics Resource Center, um, Fellows Program, and now ECI, Ethics and Compliance Initiative. Um, even in the very early years, I used to go to the conference board, used to do annual conferences on ethics in New York, and I always went to those. I wanted to interact with these people who were, this was a new field, a new um, profession, and I just found it fascinating that these people were wrestling every day with trying to figure out how to manage this in real organizations. I wanted to interact with them. I wanted to get to know them. I wanted to listen to what their concerns were, what they had to say, and um, so I haven't done a lot of consulting, actually, because I, I think it's important to know who you are. And I am primarily a researcher. And so when I have worked with companies, it's been in the rare case that they were willing to open themselves up a little bit and allow us to interview people or to survey employees. Um, that's actually getting harder and harder. Uh, it seems like organizations are cl getting more and more closed. So it's, it's difficult, actually, to do research inside organizations. But it's always been really important to me to have those connections and to um, try to get the word out about not only my research, but the other research that's going on in the field and, and see if we can't influence um, practice in, in some way, and I, I, I'd like to think that we have. Are there any particular research streams that you've developed in conjunction with the Fellows Program that have been really interesting that you want to share with us? Yeah, there's one in particular, uh, one field uh, of research in particular that was influenced by the Fellows Program and has had a huge impact on the field. So. Uh, way back in... Mm, but go back up just for a second and explain the Fellows Program. Okay, yes. Because there are lots of... Right. Yeah, people wouldn't know what the Fellows Program is. So um, the Ethics Resource Center is one of the oldest, was one of the oldest um, ethics-related not-for-profit organizations in the country. Um, when I first knew about it, it was devoted to... Uh, it had two kind of... Um, agendas. One was uh, character education in schools and the other was organizational ethics. And the uh, leader of the organization at the time had 
what I thought was a great vision, and that was to create something he called the Fellows Program, which would bring together leading ethics and compliance officers, people who were looking ahead, people who were um, forward-looking people, who were interested in advancing the field, and bring them together with people uh, from academia, leaders from academia, as well as uh, consultants and government people. And that was over 20 years ago, and it's, that fellows program continues today in a slightly different form because ERC morphed and joined with the Ethics and Compliance Officers Association, and now it's the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, and it's the fellows program is a little bit different, but that was the genesis of it. And, and um, so part of our meetings, especially in the early years, we would talk about um, what, what do the ethics and compliance officers need to know? <laughs> what, do they, what research would help them uh, do their work better? And one year, they talked about leadership as being a real problem for them. You know, if we could just get leaders to do something here, you know, to care about this, to, you know. So um, I took that in. I didn't really want to do research on leadership because I, as an org behavior person, I had studied leadership and there were a lot of people already in that in that field who sort of owned it, and I thought this is this is a nightmare. Um, but at the time, I had a doctoral student who was very interested in leadership and really wanted to do that for his dissertation. So I went back after that meeting to Penn State, and I talked to Mike Brown, who uh, was my student, and I said, you know, this is. This is what they want to do. This is what you want to do. <laughs> Seems important. So we started doing research. Uh, and actually, Laura Hartman was a fellow at the time, and she joined us on the early research. And we started out by interviewing. And, and this is where um, knowing the ethics and compliance officers really helped, because they connected us with senior executives um, we interviewed 20 very, very senior VP and CEO level people at very prominent companies, um, and as well as 20 ethics and compliance officers. So that's how this research started, and uh, asked them, since we didn't really have a field of ethical leadership, um, we asked them what ethical leadership, well, we asked them to think of it someone they would put in the category of ethical leader without defining it. And when they have somebody in their mind, which everybody very quickly did, and that was good news, we would ask them a whole series of questions about, well, tell us about this person, what are they, what are their traits, what, are, what do you think is motivating them, how do they behave, all kinds of questions about an hour-long interview. And then we took that qualitative data and um, looked for patterns and, and came up with uh, a model that we then, uh, that we published, and then uh, from that developed a survey-based measure with uh, another colleague of mine who was more of a measurement kind of person. His name is David Harrison. And with Mike Brown, Dave Harrison, and myself, we created this scale, this ethical leadership scale, um, which we published in, um, when was that, Two, 2005. And that just took off. And there, I think there are, 3,000 some odd citations to it now. There have been 
hundreds, if not more than that, studies. And it's a whole field of research that we created. Um, and there are companies who are doing ethical leadership training as a result of it. So I, I'm pretty proud of that work. I think it, it's an area I can point to where we've, re, we've made a difference. People understand. Um, and it, it focuses not just on um, the tone at the top, senior leadership, but um, actually most of the studies have been focused on the supervisory level. So we know how important uh, supervisory ethical leadership is and uh, can point to a whole host of outcomes that are affected by it. Yeah? That was in Leadership Quarterly, wasn't it? So the first paper, the one that published the scale, was in Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes. And then there have been other papers, some in Leadership Quarterly and elsewhere, yeah. Well, that's a great, been a great contribution. Yeah, and a lot of other people have done that work as well, not just us. Who, whose other work in the field of business ethics has, has really inspired you or helped you in your work? Oh, boy, that's a really good question. Who, whose work has inspired me? Um, you know, it's funny because I, I really felt like I was carving my... I was carving my own path there for so long. Um, you know, that's all right to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I, because uh, I, I guess because I'm a pioneer. That's, that's exactly what I, the picture I had was. I'm going to have to wear my, you know, my dress with my, with the with, with the bo with the bonnet. Yeah, yeah uh, right. I don't know why we got that. Memory. Yeah. But I think, but I think that's why you are a pioneer. That you were one of the first to think about this in the, from yeah. the social science perspective. Yes. And and that hadn't really been well. There's this literature on business and society which precedes you, as you know. Right. Uh, but I, that, I would say that's different. Maybe it is different. Was it, was it lonely doing that? Then, uh, you know, yes, that? at yeah. first. It yeah. was lonely uh, a bit. Um, Can you explain the difference between why you don't put yourself, I'm not kind of, in the business and society camp because you don't? I do not. No. And, and can you explain that difference to the camera? Yeah, so what's the difference between um, what yeah. I do and business and society? So it's, it's very similar to within management, the way we talk about micro and macro. Um, so I'm looking inside the organization for the most part, not always, but I'm interested mostly in individuals and groups inside the organization who are, whose, whose thoughts and behaviors are affected by um, people and things inside the organization, for the most part. Um, people who study corporate social responsibility are interested in the relationship between the corporation and outside society, government, um, other stakeholders. So it's, it's really more of an external focus with corporate social responsibility. They're interested in financial performance of the firm. That's not anything I study or care about, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm looking at people inside the organization, and I always wonder why everybody else isn't interested in what the people are doing. Because <laughs> that's what, that's, what that's what fascinates me. We just mentioned that that's the, the, the business and society literature, which comes out of the 60s, mer morphed more or less into the CSR literature, I would think. They won't put it that way, but... Yeah, I mean, that's that, I think, yes. that's for them to talk about. I'm not yes. I, I'm not they really do. an expert on corporate no, social no, responsibility. No, I, no, I, I do is. try to keep up with it for my textbook because I have a chapter on it, but um, really my expertise is, is more in looking at individuals, groups, and also things like uh, ethical culture and organizations, and all of the things that comprise that. 
and how that influences it. But again, how it influences individual and group behavior inside the organization. So to pick up from uh, Andrew and Bones, you know, would you say that you are a behavioral business ethicist? Can I, I don't think you're going to like that. I don't um, know if you're going to like it or not. So, that, so yeah, so so um, so one of the things that's really fun uh, to see. So I was asked earlier if if I if this was lonely. It's not lonely anymore. We had a professional development workshop at the Academy of Management yesterday afternoon, and it was packed, uh, and it was a behavioral business ethics um, professional development workshop. The half of the room was was PhD students, so people are fascinated, and there are some young um, young faculty members, really top notch researchers who are doing work in this area. So, seeing the development of that field has been just uh, so validating, and uh, has really made me happy. Um, but there have been some interesting side effects of it, actually. So uh, a number of years ago, I can't think of how many years now, um, probably seven or eight years ago, the Organizational Behavior Division of the Academy of Management added ethics to its mission statement. Now, ethics had always belonged to Social Issues in Management Division. And as somebody who had led the Social Issues and Management Division for a long time, but was always a member of both, I thought, oh boy, this, I don't know if this is so good for Social Issues and Management Division. And I don't think it has been, actually, because organizational behavior has sort of taken those people who do what I do um, and... A lot of them who were starting to do the work, the research, were more identified as organizational behavior researchers. And so they liked it when organizational behavior added it to their mission. And now you can submit your, your ethics-related papers to the OB division, and more and more of it is ending up there. So. It's a, it's a kind of funny situation now in the academy um, with that. But so where do you see the, the future? What, what do you think is the future of, of these sort of interlapping fields of, of business society, CSR, behavioral business ethics, the work you do, and then of course I do normative, but as you know, normative. But, but how, they all, I mean, they're all in some sense overlap, but in a lot of ways don't. But how do you see the, where, where we could, do, can you imagine what the future is maybe? Um, I'm not really good at imagining what the future is going to be. I um, so I wrote a paper with uh, with Gary Weaver, two papers actually, 1984 I think, long time no, could that be? I can't be. Uh, so 94, um, I think. Anyway, um, when Gary Weaver, uh, who was a, was a PhD student of mine, but he came with a PhD in philosophy. And um, I had been thinking about what, one of the things people were talking about at the time was that, that the normative and the social science should integrate. This was a hot topic. And I, I was very skeptical. I didn't think that was going to happen. And I wanted to write a paper about it, but I didn't feel competent to do it because I was, I, I was only on one side. Uh, I, and I could only talk the talk of that side. So he showed up in the PhD program, and one of the first things I said to him was, how would you like to write this paper with me? <laughs> and um, he said, okay. You know, so we started working on that, and uh, it ended up being two papers because BEQ reviewers said there's just too much here, split it up into two papers. And in, that, in those papers, we argued that these were related because we're interested in some of the same things. We, you know, we're interested in whistleblowing, for example, or we're interested in you know, whatever topic. But we're so different 
in our training and the, the underlying um, theories, the way we evaluate work, all kind, there's so many different ways in which we're different um, that we're, we're on parallel tracks and we're just going to keep being that way. In fact, I remember when, so Gary was there to learn to be a social scientist, that's why he came back to school. And when he was talking about what he would do for his dissertation, I said, well, if anybody's going to do integration, it's you because you're bilingual. That's why I used to call him bilingual. And he said, no, 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 you know, I'm doing a, a social science dissertation. So that was the end of that. Um, so I do think they're really different. Just the way, um, and, and I feel the same way about CSR. So... I mean, it's all about integrity. It's all about values. But I'm not going to be studying the relationship between corporate social responsibility and corporate financial performance the way the CSR people do. It's just not what I do. It's not what I know how to do. Uh, I'm not, it's not what I'm good at. It's not what I'm that interested in. Um, and there's so, the, the theories are different. Um, that's why we kind of divide up into micro, macro. Um, I mean, they're, again, they're looking outside the organization. I'm looking inside the organization for the most part. So I just think they're very different and they have different, uh, research questions, different agendas. Um, I'm interested in human beings and groups and their decisions and their performance. They're interested in corporations or organizations and their decisions and their performance. Um, it's just, you know, different skills required. Uh, they're different. They're, they're related. You know, we, we have some overlapping interests, but, but they're different. We're going to run out of time. If, if mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. So, have you got some, some last words, or do you want to have last words? I don't think it's about last words. But as you think about what you might have come in here prepared to say that we haven't asked you yeah, that's about, that's a better way to put it. <laughs> that's kind of what sort I sort of sound like a death. Think about it. Um, be discussing. I'd also love it if you could take a few minutes and talk about the Partners in Business Ethics Conference, something we've worked on together. Yeah. And I think it's a really interesting way of trying to bring deans, to bring professors, to bring practitioners together. Yeah, so, so you can talk a little bit about that and while you think about anything else you came in here to So talk. one of the things we haven't talked about at all is, is my role in ethics education. Um, so I have been teaching business ethics for a long time. And um, one of the things that I you know, I'm, I think it's really important to teach classes. Um, I think it's challenging, however, in the context of a business school and MBA program where students are getting brainwashed <laughs> with all sorts of other ideas about what's important. Um, Tell us about the partners. Yeah, I will. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things that we, I, I did a... Um, talk the other day here at, at SBE um, about something that we do at, at uh, Smeal College, which is um, an honor and integrity program. So it's, this is outside the classroom. That, uh, it's a um, kind of extracurricular way of teaching about business ethics through an honor code and trying to create a culture of honor and integrity. And uh, this um, effort was spurred in large part by an alum of ours who was on our board, uh, the, the advisory board, and she proposed and we ran with the idea of beginning um, something that has now grown and brought in a lot of other universities, Partners in Business Ethics it's called, and the, the original idea for it was to um, try to get uh, deans of business schools and business leaders together 
talking to each other about business ethics. So um, trying to get business people to explain to deans why this is important because there are a lot of deans out there who really don't think it is or that you can teach it or that you should teach it. I've had conversations with some of those teens. And so it seemed important to us to try to get those groups together. And so we we did the first conference. Um, this woman was from American Express and they sponsored it and we uh, we held it in New York. And but part part of the plan and she had done uh, used this model that she was proposing to us in some other area of her work. And she proposed that we not con- you know host it every year, that we re- that the dean of our college recruit another dean to host it the next year, and that that dean recruit another dean to host it the following year. So that has pretty much worked out. And how many, we have at least a half dozen schools now, right, that are... Um, that are now hosting this kind of a conference. Um, I'm not sure we always achieve the goal that was originally set, um, and that concerns me. But it, it's I think the the idea is a really good one. If you and I also have the feeling sometimes we're speaking to the choir, preaching to the choir, as often you you do. Um, so it's the the deans who already buy in who are coming rather than the ones that you really want to be there. Um, but it's, uh, it's been a good program. Another, one last thing I'll say is that I'm also, I've also been involved in, in an organization um, called ethicalsystems.org that was started by Jonathan Haidt at NYU, and uh, that uh, provides an awful lot of information for free to people, uh, anybody who, who wants to access it, and Um, The focus of that group is to try to get people to think in systems terms. You know, there's people inside of organizations, inside of environments, inside of societies, and that we really need to think that way in order to have an impact. And I've been involved in their work on ethical leadership, but especially the work on ethical culture and trying to develop a really good measure of that. The work has been slower than I think we hoped, but it it continues.